I will be sharing with us a message that I have entitled Going the Extra Mile. Going the Extra Mile. And I will be taking my verse from So 2 Kings chapter 4 and from verse 8 to 37. And, and I will be reading from the New Living Translation. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. 11. One day Elisha returned to Shunem and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, 13, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. 14. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, Next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. One day, when her child was older, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. 19. Suddenly, he cried out, My head hurts! My head hurts! His father said to one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. 22. She sent a message to her husband. Send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today? He asked. It is neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. 24. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. 
Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my stuff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the stuff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. 31. Gehazi hurried ahead and laid the stuff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, laying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back, and forth across the room once and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. 36. Then Elisha Sermon Gehazi called the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for your word. Spirit of God, this evening I ask that you breathe your breath of life on your word. As the seed of your word is sown into our hearts, May you cause the ground of our heart to be softened to receive the seed. May you cause the seed to germinate and to bear good and great fruit in the name of Jesus. Father, use me as an empty vessel to speak your truth, to speak the mystery of your word to your people. In the mighty name of Jesus and as each person hears your word. May you minister your word to the level of their understanding. Let the living, the life of your word give life to every area in our lives that is death. In the name of Jesus, I thank you and I bless you in Jesus' name. Okay, so this was a very long read and we're going to take it right from the beginning. So 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8 to 37 and now let's look from verse 8 so the bible says one day elisha went to the town of shunni a wealthy woman lived there now something caught my attention here the bible says a wealthy woman so lady belly likes to be controversial a wealthy woman so I just decided to look up the word wealth or wealthy in the dictionary. And it said a great quantity or store of money, valuable possessions, property, or other riches. A lot of the time we think that wealth has got nothing to do with riches. It includes riches. It includes anything, anything that is of high value anything so properties possession anything that is valuable so it's a great quantity so it's not just about having it money money is not just money few money is not worth it's when you have great quantity 
So having one or two possession, that's not worth having great quantity. So this woman had great quantity of great quantity or store of money, possessions, properties, and other riches. So she wasn't a poor woman as we like to convey to people that, you know, when you follow God, you have to let go of all these things. You don't need money is the root of all evil and all this. And the Bible says the woman was wealthy, not the man. The woman was wealthy. So I'll leave it there because that's not my mess. I just wanted to highlight that. And then the Bible says that she urged the man or Elisha come her home or her house to, to come and eat. So this is a woman that just thought to herself, you know what? Let me just invite this man in to come and eat. And then after she had done that, when you read verse 9 and verse 10, she decided, you know, she spoke with her husband. Then she decided that, you know, this man, I've seen him come here to Shunem a couple of times, you know. He's always coming around. It would be a good idea if I can find a permanent place for him to come and stay. So that anytime he comes to town, he doesn't have to worry about trying to find somewhere to live. He doesn't need to book a hotel or anything like that. He can always know or he would always know that he's always welcome here. So you know what? Let me build a permanent place for him here in my house. So that anytime he's in town, he will know that he has a place to call home. To come to where he can rest, he can relax, and he can be fed. Okay. So immediately, this reminded me of the woman with the issue of blood. When she, she just said to herself, when you look at Matthew chapter 9 verse 21, the Bible says that she said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, or the hem of his garment, I will be healed. No one told her that. She just decided, if only I can press through the crowd, get close enough and touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I know whatever it is I'm looking for, the healing that I'm looking for, the healing, the, the mystery, the burden that I carry, this disease that I'm carrying, that has eaten up all my money. I've been to everywhere and no one is able to help. Maybe if I can just press in and get close enough and touch the helm of his garment, I will be healed. And lo and behold, she did that and she received her healing. So the woman said to herself or her husband, you know, no, it, I think it would be a good idea. It's, you know, it's okay. It's lovely. It's nice that, you know, when he comes, we invite him to come and eat. But would it not be even great if we can actually give him a place to stay, you know, make him comfortable, give him a permanent place so that anytime he comes to town, he knows where to come to, to come and rest. And then when you look at verse 9 and 10, So 11 said, so the next time that um, Elisha came to town to show him, he went straight to the woman's house, to the upper room, to go and rest. So, he, I mean, the man of God was wondering, hmm, for someone to go out of their way to do that, is there anything that she's looking for? The man of God, I'm sure the prophet was probably thinking, maybe the woman is doing what she's doing, this act of kindness, because she wants something. So since she's gone out of her way to do this, to make sure that I have a place to put my head, to make sure I'm comfortable, I'm fed, to make sure that when I come into town, I'm not stranded. When I come into town, I have somewhere to stay. Let me find out if there's anything that she needs. So the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 10, 41, and it says, He who gives honor to a prophet in the name of a prophet will be given a prophet's reward. So now Elisha asked Gehazi to call the woman to come. And they asked the woman, is there anything we can do for you? 
do you want us to go and speak to the commander maybe you want us to go and speak to to the king is there anything that you need is there any favor that you need is there anything i can do for you i can do to help you and she said no i'm very all right so she showed that that act of kindness had nothing to do with anything that she was looking for majority of the time a lot of us do things for people because beneath it all we are seeking for something so our actions are driven by our own need but this is a woman who went out of her way to do what she did not because of her need she didn't want anything from the man of god she perceived elisha was a man of god but yet she didn't want anything from him she just wanted to make sure that the man of god is honored and the man of god is comfortable how many of us go to church you know you give here and there you do the thing you said you know you have you do service in church whatever it is you're doing you're doing because underneath it all you're driven by your own need you're being very fervent in church very active in church because you're seeking for something from god you're praying honestly asking god for something and then that is what is driving you to do the things that you're doing which means that more likely when you receive whatever it is you're looking for you're probably gonna stop doing whatever it is you're doing some people go out of their way to serve men of god not because they genuinely want to honor him but because they want the anointing of god on their life so that once they have received it they'll be gone but this is a woman that served that honored the man of god seeking for nothing so now elisha between elisha and gehazi they have to figure it out no even though she said there must be something and so gehazi said i've looked around i can see the woman doesn't have any any child around and the husband looks old so elisha asked gehazi to call the woman back and when she came back he didn't ask her we have you know what we have taken a look around and i can see there's no child in this house perhaps would you like a son do you want a child no when the woman came back when elisha asked gehazi to call the woman back and the woman came back elisha immediately began to prophesy to the woman and said a year by this time next year by this time verse 16 you will be holding a son in your arms it's like the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and everything else will be added because the woman sought out to make sure the man of God was okay was taken care of, was looked after was comfortable what she never even asked for the man of God began to prophesy over her and began to speak and make declaration of whatever her probably her deepest need was so this evening's message going the extra mile it's not enough it's not enough to do what everyone else is doing so yes you go to church yes you pray yes you read your bible so what everyone else does it what are you going to do that will move the heart of god that will move the might of god to come in and make things happen for you even the thing that you don't think that you need what would you do that will cause heaven to move on your behalf because you have touched the heart of god what would you do and you can see from her response in verse 16 when she said no my lord she cried oh man of god do not deceive me and get my you can see from her response that that was something even though she didn't have a child she had given up she had given up on any opportunity to have a child she had given up all hope she had even forgotten what her need 
was. She had probably spent years trying everything she knew how to. And nothing. There was no fruitfulness in any of her effort. So she had just shut the door. How many of us are going through situations that you have tried everything you know how. And it doesn't seem like anything is happening in your corner. And you have just decided. You have made conclusion that you know what. Perhaps marriage is not for me. Perhaps I'm not meant to be a mother or a father. Perhaps this job, this position is not for me because I don't qualify because of the color of my skin. Whatever the situation is, you have made a permanent decision on your circumstance. You have shut, the, you have opened the closet, locked it in there, shut it, and you've thrown the key away. You've totally removed it from your mind. Because you don't want to spend any more of your time, any more of your years chasing after something that looks like it's never going to happen in your lifetime. So you have given up. So she said to the man of God, No, no, my Lord. Don't deceive me. Don't tell me what you think I need to hear. Yes, you may you may not have seen any child yet. Don't give me any false hope because I'm not asking. I have given up. It's okay. I have accepted my faith. Do not come and stir up any hope. I'm okay. I've accepted it. Allow me, let me get on with my love. Let me live. How many of us are experiencing, are facing the Red Sea and it doesn't look like there's any hope and you have given up? But hear the word of the Lord. Next year, by this time, you will be holding a son. In your arms. Not that next year by this time you'll be pregnant. No. Next year by this time you would have given birth. To that which you so desire. To the very thing that you have shut the door on. You've locked it and thrown the key away. Next year by this time. You will be holding that thing. You will, if it's a dream, if it's a vision, if it's a business, whatever it is, if it's a marriage, if it's healing, whatever it is that you had spent years trusting God for and it doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. Hear the word of the Lord. Next year, by this time, you will be holding your son. You'll be holding your child. You'll be holding your dream. You'll be holding your healing. You'll be holding your marriage. Whatever it is, next year by this time, you will possess it. And again, she reminded me of Sarah. When Abraham saw three strangers walking, and the Bible says, he perceived that this strange, there was something unique. See the power of discernment. He perceived, Abraham perceived that there's something unique about these people. So he invited them in and he asked Sarah to cook something, bake something, make sure they are comfortable, cook something, let them eat. And when he had finished, when they had finished serving them, making them comfortable and honoring them, one of them said, a year by this time, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Bible says that Sarah overheard it and she was laughing. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe when I was 50, 60. Now 90. Are you kidding me? But this is what going the extra mile does. Going the extra miles, open doors of favor. Or doors of favors that it seems impossible. It opens doors for you. It opens who can stand in the way of the Lord. Favor is that which opens doors that you know you don't deserve. And in order to obtain that kind of favor, you must be willing to go the extra mile. Do what others will not do. 
So when you look at verse 21, He said, so the servant took him, took him home and his mother laid him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. So verse 21, she carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. Then shut the door and left him there. So what the woman didn't un understand by her act of kindness, that she was building an altar, a permanent altar in her place, in her, in her home, that would later on serve her. She never, she just thought, this is a man of God. He's always coming in and out. Let me give him a place where he can feel comfortable and rest. She didn't know that her kind gesture was for her own interest, her own benefit. So, by her action, what she did was she built an altar. So now when the son died, the Bible said the woman went up to the upper room. Mm. To the upper room and laid the dead body of the son on the bed of the prophet. So she laid her son on the altar. So I decided to look at the definition of altar. And the dictionary says, an altar is an elevated place or structure at which religious rites are performed or on which sacrifices are offered. So the woman laid her son on the altar to be sacrificed. She laid her son on the altar as a sacrifice. In the upper room. When you go to the book of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says the disciples went up into the upper room to wait on the Holy Spirit for the filling of the Holy Spirit. There is something about the upper room. There are some times when you're waiting on God, when you're faced with a dead situation, a situation that has no turning, you cannot just approach God anywhere. You have to go up to the upper room and make sacrifice. You have to make sure you lay something as a sacrifice on the altar. You can't go empty handed. When you are faced with a dead situation, you have to make sure you have something to go and sacrifice on the altar in the upper room. So the upper room could be your, your bedroom. Wherever it is in your home, wherever area, you must have an upper room. And in that upper room, you must build an altar so that when you are faced with the challenges, the vicissitudes of life, where it doesn't seem like anything can come through, you go and battle it out with God. You go and you lay the situation on the altar of God. You lay the situation in the bed of the man of God and cry out. You battle it out with God. The altar. And it reminded me also. When two people are going to marry. The, we know that they walk down. And they make their way to the altar. I don't know if we've ever thought about it. But this is just me throwing it out there. So as the two people walk up to the altar. Significantly what they are going to do. Is they are going to. The two people are going to sacrifice their life on that altar. So that now after the ceremony. It was two people that walked down. But now they return as one. <laughs> so that's just something for you to think about. When you look at verse 22 to 24, the woman sent, the woman sent a message to her husband that he should send one of the servants and a donkey. It's because she wants to hurry and go and see the man of God. And she'll be right back. The husband asked her, why? Why do you, why must you, why you, why, why are you in a hurry? Why must you go? Because it's not a Sabbath day. 
it's not a new moon festival. What what will make you? But here, when I read it, it just hit me. I was like, wait. So the woman didn't even tell the husband what had happened. When the boy, when the husband told the servant to bring the boy from the field to the, to the mother at home, the boy was alive. But whilst the boy was at home, the boy died. Now the woman sent a servant to go and get donkey from the husband and then she wants to go and see it. And the woman never revealed to the husband what had happened. There are sometimes when you are faced with death, when the challenge that you're faced with is a life and death situation, you don't, you don't need to talk to anybody. You don't need to reveal what you're facing, going through with anybody because nobody can help you. And I asked myself, I was asking the Holy Spirit, why did the woman not tell her husband that, babe, our son is gone? Maybe she knew that right now, I don't need anyone's opinion with what I'm going through, what I'm faced with. I don't need anyone's opinion. I don't need anyone to try to comfort me. I don't need anyone to, to try and convince me that the situation is dead. There's no hope. No, no. She just knew what she needed to do was to go and see the man of God. And so she didn't tell anyone. She just needed to. Sometimes we go through situations and then, you know, we call, we are on the phone to our girlfriends, our boyfriends, we are calling our parents, our siblings, whoever to tell them. And sometimes you don't need to talk to anybody, not even your closest person. It's just between you and God. Because in those kind of moments, people out of their love may decide to advise you. And those advices might be great, but it's not needed. Because her son is dead. Imagine her telling her husband, that's a whoa, well, if he's dead, just send a message to the prophet so that they'll come and, you know, maybe we'll organize a funeral. Or maybe if he's dead, why bother the, the prophet? It's too late now. Sometimes you tell people about what you're facing and they tell you, you know, yeah, maybe it's true. They start having pity party with you. Yeah, maybe it's true. You're right, you know. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. No, that man, no. Here is the case. God had promised. There was a prophecy. The man of God had prophesied. And that prophecy had come to pass. The woman was holding her blessing. And then how the hell could I have lost my blessing? How the hell could the enemy have killed my son? How could the enemy snatch out of my hand the very thing that God had promised me, God had given me? So I know I don't need to discuss this with anybody. I need to go back to the promise maker and the promise keeper. Nobody else. And that's where our mistakes are sometimes. We begin to talk our issues with others. And they can help you. Sometimes what you're facing, you don't need pity parties. Sometimes what you're facing, when you're faced with death, you don't need people partying. It's okay, it's going to be. No, you need to be radical. And you need to go back to God and remind him. So she drove with a servant on the donkey and said, do not. Speak to nobody. Hurry up. Do not slow down until I ask you to. And Bible says when she was at a distance far off, the prophet Elisha saw her coming and sent Gehazi to go and meet her. Isn't that like the prodigal son when the Bible said that the father saw him coming from a distance and ran to go and meet him. Because the woman had done something that had touched the man of God, she had obtained such favor from the man of God that even from a distance, he would send someone to go and meet him. What are you doing for God so that even before you get to him, 
He will send his angels charge concerning you to take her to inquire of you what is making my son or daughter sad? What is making my son or daughter cry? Who has done what to my son or daughter? Go and inquire and go and deal with it. What are you doing that will move the heart of God, that will place you in such a high esteem, high position in the heart of God that it will cause him before you even come get close to him he has already sent helpers your way there is something about going the extra mile you obtain favor when you go the extra mile when it comes to god the things of god when it comes to the kingdom when you go the extra mile what you do is you cause the heart of God to move speedily. Look at the billions of people in the world, Christians, everyone is calling on God. What is it that will cause God to stop everything and move towards your direction? What is it? What is it? So that when everyone else is pushing and touching Jesus, Jesus will stop and say, no, someone touched me. And then Peter said, but, 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 but Jesus, there's so much crowd around us. Everyone is pushing and shoving and people are touching. I like, no, 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 no. I know people are touching, but this touch, it was not just a touch because this particular touch, it pulled power virtue out of me what is it that you're doing in god's house what is it that you're doing with your relationship with god that will cause even your tears to pull on the power of god to act on your behalf before you have asked bible says that before you've asked he god what is it that you're going to do that before you ask god will move on your behalf what is it that you're doing that will cause heaven to stand still hmm. until until salvation has come to your house until whatever you're faced with there's a turning point what are you going to do what are you doing are you just doing what everyone else is doing because that is not enough if you want to obtain some level of favor bible says that you know all these young virgins they were they all marched before the king what was it about esther that caused the king who was already married that caused esther to find favor before the king what was it That goes to also show that there are different levels of favor. What was it that Esther did that would cause Queen Vashti to lose her position and Esther, who is a foreigner, who is in the camp of the, her enemy, to find favor in the very place that she's supposed to be killed, she found favor and she was made the next queen what is it that you are doing what is it that you're going to do that will cause god to make you find favor with the very people that are pursuing your life the very people that are backbiting the very people that are gossiping the very people that are determined to destroy you what is it that will cause god to move on your behalf and cause those same people to be a blessing to you those same people to open the door for you what is it are you going to do that will cause God to move, to move mountains on your behalf. And then when you look at verse 27, the Bible says that when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Then Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled. But the Lord has not told me what it is. The Bible says that when she got to the man of God, she fell to the ground. 
So when you are dealing with situations, that is hopeless. When you're dealing with that situation, the only posture is fall on the ground. The only posture is to lay prostrate before God as a sign of humility, as a sign of submission, and as a sign that God, if you don't come through for me, I have no hope. She fell to the ground. She fell to the ground. Don't forget, this was a wealthy woman. So a woman that carried herself. A woman that's probably very well respected. I'm sure whatever she was wearing, when she got, it was probably, you know, top brands. Because she was wealthy, the Bible describes her. She's wearing designers. Some of us, we go to church. And, you know, we have our um, Peruvian, Brazilian. We have our nicely done makeup. That we don't even want to cry. Because we don't want to mess up our, you know, our makeup. We go and we put our hands in our pocket. We don't even want to lift up our hands. Because we don't want to look too holy and all that. Oh, you are not facing a dead situation. Because when you are facing a dead situation, you don't care what people are thinking. You don't care who is looking at you. It reminds me of Isaiah Hannah when she went into the house of God and she began to cry because only her knew what she was dealing with. That even the prophet thought that he, she was drunk. When you are dealing or when you are faced with a dead situation, how you look doesn't matter. What people think or say about you doesn't matter. You are not aggressive enough. You are hearing what people are saying. You are taking on board what people are saying because you are not aggressive enough. Because you are not desperate enough. Because desperation, they say desperate people do desperate things. When you become desperate, when you're faced with a hopeless situation, it doesn't matter how expensive your clothing is. It doesn't matter what position you hold. When you come, when you know the only person that can come through for you is God, you, you doff off your position. You doff off anything and then you come totally submitted, totally on the floor because you know my help comes from the Lord. Bible says in the book of Psalms, I look up to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. When you're faced with a dead situation, nothing, position, title doesn't mean jack. The only posture is fall to the ground, lay flat on your face. That is the posture when you're faced with hopeless situations, when you're dealing with dead situations. We go to God and we are making demands and as if he, he, owes, he owes you. You are not serious enough. And that's why you haven't seen any change. In what you're facing that's why whatever dead situation you're facing there's no it hasn't received life that's why whatever hopeless situation you're dealing with you it hasn't received hope because you have not understood the posture the posture that will move god to act on your behalf and then she didn't only fall to the ground but it says she caught hold of his feet so i wanted to that drew my attention and then I wanted to look up. What is there any significance? Is there any meaning? So I started searching. And they said, holding someone's feet means you are pressuring the person to do something for you. It also means you're holding the person accountable or you're forcing the person to comply. So when she fell to the ground and she held onto Elisha's feet, she was literally demanding from Elisha, so 
to confirm what I'm saying, listen to what came out of her mouth. She said, verse 28, did I ask you for a son? That means that this woman was holding Elisha accountable. Did I ask you for a son? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Did I ask you for a son? So since you wanted to bless me, God, you blessed me. God, you blessed me. God, you raised, you promoted me. God, you gave me this man. You gave me this woman. You gave me this child. Why has my child now become a problem on society? Why is my child now dealing with this illness and this disease? No, doctor. God, I'm holding you to your word. She held the posture. Feet prostrate, lay prostrate and hold onto the feet of God. Now that means you are holding God accountable to his word. You are holding God accountable to his promise. For his word says that my words are yea and amen. And that my word will not return to me void. So now how can you bless me with a son? And now allow the enemy to take that son. God, you must prove yourself on my behalf. You must come through. You must come through on my behalf because my enemies are laughing at me. How can you? You give me something and take it back from me. No, God, holding the prophet accountable, pressuring the prophet to do something for her. She came to remind the prophet, did I ask you? So sometimes you have to go back to God and remind God of his word. Remind God of his promise to you. So it's, it's not enough for you to go and cry to God. What, what does that mean? Your tears. What does that mean? Is God supposed? No. Remind God of his word. Because his covenant is not with you. His covenant is his word. He said, I have sworn by myself. His covenant is his word. So hold in. Hold God to his word. Lay prostrate. Hold God on his feet. And hold him to his word. When you're faced with dead situations. You go back to God because he is the one that promised you. He is the one. So the promise keeper. He promised you. So remind him. Of that promise sometimes God blesses you with marriage children and then your marriage is facing problem issues and you're calling your girlfriends to talk to them about your problems that is the mistake that's why those issues that you're facing in your marriage that's why eventually it has ended up in a divorce your child God blessed you with a son with a daughter He's sick. She's sick. The doctors are not giving you any good news. You're calling your mom. You're calling your dad to talk, to complain, to talk to him. No, there's nothing they can do. Go back. Go back to the covenant keeping God. He must keep to his word. Go and remind. Don't go and cry to him. Go and remind him of his word because he has sworn by his word that his word will not return to him void. That he's not a man that he should lie. Has he said it and will he not do it? So how come you said it and then my son has died? God, I'm holding you accountable. So she held onto the man of God's feet while she laid on the floor. Mm. Well, I hope this word is blessing you. And if it's blessing you, please share it because you don't know what someone is going through. You don't know what Red Sea someone is facing. You don't know what death situation someone is encountering. You don't know where in the season that someone is 
and how their hope and their faith is given up on them. And maybe this word will be the very thing that will speak life into them and give them hope. But please share this word, share this message so that someone will connect. Someone that's about to throw in the towel, someone that thinks that that's it. There is no point of me living. I have nothing else to give in this life. Someone that wants to give up on life. Share this message so that they will know that when you're faced with a dead situation, you go before God. You go before God. You lay prostrate before him and remind him what is it that God has promised you? What was the promise of God? What was the prophecy that you received? Remind God of his word because he is obligated. He's mandated to act on his word. I pray this evening, this word has been a blessing to all of us. We thank God by his spirit for this seasonal word going the extra mile if you want to receive or attract favor indescribable favor unimaginable favor you have to be ready to do what others will not do you have to Yes, look crazy. Let people talk about you. Let people say you are foolish. Let people say that you're wasting your resources and your money and your time and you're following this man of God and you're doing this and they're lying to you, they're manipulating you and blah, blah, blah. Let them say because you know, you know why you're doing what you're doing. You know. Don't listen to people. Don't allow the noises to get into your head and you miss. This woman created a permanent place in her home for the man of God and she received the blessing of her child as a result when she honored him she received the very thing that she had given up on and now that she's faced with the death situation she knew where to go back to so this also proves that just because God has blessed you with the marriage that means it's done. Just because God has blessed you with a son, that means it's done. Because sometimes we receive the blessing and we think this is it. You shut the door, you go about your business. Now you don't even talk to God that much. Now when the man of God, oh, oh yeah. Now you choose us and when to go to church. Now you're using that blessing, the very blessing, the very thing that God has given you has now become your excuse and has now become the reason why you cannot diligently seek God like you used to. So that means that whatever it is you did to attract that blessing, you better make sure you keep that thing going because had this woman cut off ties with this man of God after she had received her son, she didn't know that her son is going to grow up and die. Now imagine she received her prophecy. The prophecy had manifested. And now she decided. That's why they say it this way. Do not burn bridges. Well, if you must shut the door, make sure you shut the door properly. Because you just never know when you may have to go back. You just might never know when you may need that bridge again to cross to the other side. Has she cut ties with the man of God, with the prophet? Because now she's received one thing that she had worked all her life for, how would she have gone back to the man of God? Great wisdom. Let's grow this platform. Not because of me. Let's grow this platform because God is speaking his heart and his mind to us through this, through this platform. And I know we are growing and it's shaping us up. I thank you. And if you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, I urge you to do so. And as you do so, may God bless you. And this evening, Father, I pray that whoever has taken the time to join me on this live stream and later on, whatever dead situation, whatever they are going through or faced with in this season where it doesn't seem like there's any turning point, where all hope is gone, where everything they have done this time is not working. Father, as you sent me 
here to speak your word. May they encounter life. Mm. May the life of your word minister to them. Bring faith and hope again. In the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name. God bless you, everyone. I love you all. I'm grateful for your time.